Hi, my name is Chris Parkhurst. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also the host of the Documentary Life podcast, a show that spans 140 episodes, has been downloaded in over 135 countries, and uh, I've been producing for about five years. I decided to put each and every episode up here onto YouTube to sort of expand the audience, and as we say in the show, maybe inspire and inform some more doc filmmakers, hopefully like yourself. Um, in the episodes, you may find some older, maybe outdated URLs, in particular, any of the documentary filmmaking courses that we do offer online. If you have any questions about the URLs, simply look in the show notes on this page here on this YouTube page, and that'll be able to take you where you need to go to. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, it's great to have another listener to The Documentary Life. Have a great day. Microphone check, one, two, CC, hello and welcome, CC, hello and welcome, one, two, three, four, five, six, she sells seashells by the seashore, she sells seashells by the seashore, there we go, rolling. Development allows me to sit there and kind of, you know, develop ideas for other people and other projects um, for companies that I work for. And then if the right one comes along, then I'm in prime position, you know. So I, I really would encourage people to like consider it as a career. It wasn't easy. It took a lot of time. They were very wary. They'd had a really bad experience with people in the media before promising them all kinds of things that had never materialized. But it, it took, yeah, it took four years really to earn their trust. And, and, and even making the film, there were occasions where I didn't know if they'd, they'd show up for the interviews. Hello and welcome to The Documentary Life, a show that sets out to inspire and inform you on how to best live and lead your own documentary life. I am your host, Chris G. Parkhurst, and this is episode number 85. And it is brought to you by Barong Films, proud creators of Documentary Film, The Documentary Life Podcast, and The Documentary Academy, our industry-changing A to Z documentary filmmaking program that will transform you into the documentary filmmaker that you've always wanted to be. Find out more at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. So I'd been hearing a lot about this film called Three Identical Strangers over the past few months. A couple of friends whose opinions I greatly respect when it comes to docs, one of them being my wife's, told me that not only did I have to see this film, but that I'd have to get someone involved with the film onto the show. As you know, two weeks ago we were in Philadelphia attending Podcast Movement and giving a TDL workshop. Unlike when we're at home and have the responsibility of putting on the podcast, running the Brong Films business, our doc film project, and keeping our two and four year olds in line, while in Philly, Steph and I actually had the time to go see an actual film at an actual theater. I know, shock horror, right? So we were more than elated to see that Three Identical Strangers was playing a well-established art house right there in the city. Now again, while I'm sure that the vast majority of you have probably already seen the film, or at least know in part the story of it, I on the other hand, I did not. I know, that probably seems ridiculous. A doc filmmaker like myself and the host of a documentary filmmaking podcast not knowing much about one of the biggest docs currently having a very successful theatrical run. But hey, what can I say? I've got some things going on over here. It is what it is, right? In any case, I was able to see, no, I was able to experience this film without knowing much about it at all. And wow, what a way to experience it. It felt pure somehow. And really, I'd argue it's the absolute best way to see this kind of a film on the big screen. I had a similar experience when I, when I went to see Searching for Sugarman. I literally knew not one thing about that doc. So just imagine sitting in a theater during the part where, you know, one, they think that they discover that the singer Rodriguez is dead. And then later, two, discover that he is, in fact, alive and well. It's just that no one's known where he's been. To put it in some perspective, it's nearly impossible in this day and age of media saturation, online promotional blitzes, and social media to avoid knowing what half of a film is all about before actually seeing it. So on those very, very rare cases where you actually get to see a film in its purest, most untainted form, well, that is truly a beautiful and remarkable experience, and not one that we often have. 
So that being said, before we get to our conversation with Tim, I do want to let you know that there will be no spoilers for anyone out there who has not seen the film, and mostly because I'd like for you to be able to have as much chance as I did to have a terrific film-going experience. So as you listen to today's show, you won't have to worry about that, about spoilers. In fact, you can just sit back, relax, and enjoy this wonderful conversation that I had with fellow doc lifer Tim Wardle. Unless that is, of course, you're at the gym or in your car or mowing the lawn. Whatever it is that you do when you listen to this show. That's all coming up next in just a few brief moments here on The Documentary Life. When I first started making documentary films, I was often making them entirely on my own dime. It wasn't that it was a conscious decision on my part. I just really wanted to get out and start making my film. Does this sound familiar to you? When you have a great idea for a doc and the opportunity to get out there and start shooting, you don't want to let something like money get in the way of that. And for a while, it may not. But unfortunately, unless you have unlimited resources, eventually it will. Not having money for your doc film will slow you down, reduce your crew size, your film production values and aesthetics, even the story you're able to tell. And that's not even accounting for the additional stress, frustration, and your inability to work on the project full time. We don't accept that for ourselves anymore, and we don't want you to accept it either. Money is out there for every documentary film, and that includes yours. Every day, money is donated or awarded to documentary films. Why not yours? The trick is in knowing where to look for it and how to secure it for your film. In the Documentary Academy, we have the most comprehensive funding module that you will find anywhere in any course on fundraising for your documentary film. We cover the A to Z on raising funds for your film so you will never again be left wondering where the money's coming from. Enroll in the Academy today by going to thedocumentarylife.com slash academy and start your journey to raising ten, twenty-five, dollars 25 or even $100,000 for your documentary film. I'm very excited to have on today's guest here on the program. We're speaking with Tim Wardle, the director of Three Identical Strangers. I'm sure you are well aware of this of this documentary, really sensation in many ways. Unlike a lot of doc films nowadays, this uh, this one is is has had and is currently having an incredibly successful theatrical run, which is yes, very exciting for doc filmmakers. And uh, and Tim, we are excited to talk about your doc life as well as this particular film. So welcome to the Documentary Life podcast. It's great to have you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me on. So, Tim, what we like to do at the beginning of episodes when we have a doc industry person come on is we'd love to hear initially a little bit about the background. That way we can have some sort of context or story building up to where we are today. So let's go back in time here, if you will, a little bit, Tim, even before the, the production company that you are a major part of, Raw TV. Let's talk about life for you early on that led to you being a filmmaker. How did filmmaking become a thing for you? Well, I, I've always been obsessed with movies since I was an early teenager. I just um, I had very uh, liberal parents who, who let us kids do pretty much anything yeah. apart from the one thing they tried to stop us do was watch TV and film. And so, of course, that was the, my only way of rebelling uh, was to was to kind of watch as many movies as I, as I could and kind of uh, sneak around to people's houses and, and, and just voraciously consume stuff. So I was always... <laughs> fascinated by by films and, and i guess not documentary until later teenage life uh went to university to do psychology and then halfway through my course they started up a, a, a film course there so i kind of um uh transitioned to that to, to doing that uh, mm. degree and and came out of university and um I got a job just as a as a runner, like a lot of people, kind of uh, you know, like a gopher. Also known as a, a PA or a production assistant here in the US. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even more, possibly even more junior than that. I mean, it was like <laughs> you know, really basic stuff I was doing. Um, 
I, and I actually started off um, moving into to, to drama. We had a low budget drama series here, um, which gave a lot of young directors uh, early opportunities. So I, I work with uh, directors like Andrea Arnold, mm. uh, who, who, who's made American Honey and other great, great films early in her career. What series um, was that, Tim? It was. It's called Coming Up, and okay. Channel Four, who who yeah. actually put some money into the uh, to, to this film, and yeah. a, and are kind of like a, a broadcaster, like the BBC, a smaller version of the BBC That's in right. the UK. They they used to run this, so I worked on that for a bit, and then I kind of fell into documentary. I got a job with a company called Century Films, uh, who've been around a long time. There's a guy there who runs the company called Brian Hill, who is a probably one of Britain's most famous documentarians and he he's very famous for doing um kind of hybrid documentaries so he goes right. like documentaries using poetry and using music uh, he he made famously uh, a film in a, a prison for young young offenders in the uk that was that was uh, where they performed their stories yes. inside the prison in kind of poetry and in um uh, in, in, in song as well. Um, so, and I learned so much working for that company. I was there for seven years. Um, and then after that kind of moved on to, to various other uh, companies in a kind of documentary capacity, um, working in different roles, um, for the BBC I worked for, for a bit, and then, uh, independent production companies, including raw, the company that I'm, I'm at now. And now Raw started in 2001, I believe. Were you there at the at the outset, at the beginning of Raw? Or, or I mean, I know you were there early on. Was Raw initially part of your production company? Uh, no, I wasn't there. It, okay. Weirdly, my wife was, although I didn't know her then. And, oh, and well. <laughs> when we got together, it was like, oh, you were there at the beginning. But no, I've, I've only been working for Raw for about five years, just over five years. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, they were, they, they'd be going, going a while now. And you now were you initially brought on as an as an executive producer at Raw? No, I was originally brought on my, my, as a as a development producer, head oh, that's of right, development. development. So that's my, right. my 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 background is really as a development guy. Like yes. I've I've made a few films for television in the UK. Probably about I've made about four or five documentaries, but. I'd say 70% of my career here has been working in development. So that's like the ideas guy for each company. Right. You know, I've been head of development for BBC documentaries, for Raw, for Blast, for Century. Wow. These are all different production companies. And where your job is to kind of marshal all the ideas floating around the company and coming into the company and then pitch them out um, to, to, to broadcasters and, and funders. And this is great because I, I would love to have a little bit of a conversation, certainly about development. We have not had anyone on the program, nor have we had a segment devoted to really specifically to uh, this idea of development. And um, that would be that would be good to actually good to, to talk about here in a moment. Uh, before we do that. Tell us, give us a, a snapshot of the type of programming that Raw does. So Raw does a real wide range. I mean, from kind of reality US shows like Gold Rush, which is one of the biggest shows on Discovery, yeah. and um, and Locked Up, which is is a really long running. Uh, it's been on that Geo for ages and ages. A series about people oh, yeah. getting locked up in prisons and in trouble for you know carrying drugs and stuff abroad. To um, really serious stuff for the BBC. And Channel Four here in the UK, and then also um, these feature documentaries. So that we've made The Imposter uh, a few years back. Yes. My colleague Bart Layton, and and his recent film, first foray into drama, uh, American Animals, which is in theaters uh, right now. I think. Right. In fact, I did not even know the connection. I did not realize realize it was the same director. Uh, the Imposter is an incredible doc. <laughs> yeah, I mean that was one of the reasons that I wanted to come to Raw to kind of learn that. Um, kind of past tense storytelling style that mm. they've they've really honed on on series like um like locked up which which bart um kind yeah. of created yeah, um yeah, and yeah. My, my background prior to prior to coming to raw is much more a, a kind of verite observational filmmaker yeah um so i, I you know I'm, I'm used to i don't know for example being in a prison so i, I made a film totally. in a prison where i was seven seven months in a prison with a camera yep. filming britain's biggest prison for for convicted murderers that's right uh, just actuality you know what we call actuality observational filming yeah. so um Coming here to learn that kind of style, the imposter kind of style of storytelling, was it was a big draw for me. Uh, you mentioned uh, observational docs. Was was Fred Weisman by chance an inspiration for you at all? And if not, who would you say was? I mean, you've got the founding fathers over here, people like John Grierson. And, no, of course, really the Grierson's kind of, the classic, yeah. Yeah, Key and, 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 and Weisman as well. And I, I think, you know, I, 
what I love about documentaries, it's such a broad church. You know, you've got <laughs> everyone in the US from people like Steve James to um, people like, uh, you know, Errol Morris, yes. you know, really different styles of filmmaking. And I, and I just love I love all different kinds of, 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 of documentary filmmaking. And, and Raw is a company that kind of yeah. it, it encourages um uh, all the uh, you know playing with form and like just using all those different influences you know documentaries can be very a very strict kind of genre where people are like this is this is the way this is our pure documentary should be made mm -hmm. and I, I, what's lovely at raw is they they embrace all, all different kinds of filmmaking um, a couple of things there you mentioned steve james it's funny he is you know steve we and we had steve on the program uh re let's see it would have been the week that uh he was up for the academy award for uh for abacus he, uh, so Steve was on the program and, and it was such a, a, a lovely conversation with a very down to earth guy. And, and you'll appreciate this, Tim, like yourself and like myself, Steve started out as a runner or as a, as a PA in the industry and kind of worked his way up from there. And, and then of course got into doc. And in fact, he was working as a PA, uh, in the commercial industry when, um, at the time of, uh, of, uh, of hoop dreams. And, uh, and Steve is, you know, one of those doc names that often comes up when you talk about people that were very influential to us, to us filmmakers. And, um, it comes up all the time. Yeah. I was, I was really fortunate. I, I, to meet him recently at, uh, the, the true false film festival. Oh yeah. And, yeah. Uh, lovely. It was a, just a, just a lovely down to earth guy. I mean, he's a legend, as you say, in the, yeah. in the documentary world and, um, just seemed like a really normal decent bloke which is you know what i like about documentaries yeah. is that I, I do feel out out of all certainly on the television side all the people i've been exposed to in different parts of the industry from entertainment through to drama to whatever documentary yeah. people are by and large just really lovely people it's so true it's so true and it and it really comes out on this show it comes out with 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 our listeners who we like to fondly refer to as doc lifers uh, it's, it's been a delight, you know, we've been doing this show for just over two years. And one of the things, uh, Tim, that's been a, a really lovely experience is feel, and we're downloaded in over 140 countries. And, and what has been a lovely part of this is feeling, uh, connected to people globally in the sense of, of doc filmmakers that are around the world and we're all telling stories and we're all doing similar work. And you know what doc filmmakers by and large. And again, I come from a commercial background and, uh, and, and Steph, my wife comes from a features background, not to say anything disparaging about commercial or features because, uh, very thankful for those backgrounds, but the doc people are just a different breed. I just, you know, I'm not going to lie. I prefer doc people. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. I mean, and, I absolutely uh, feel like doc people, they, they tend to be outward looking, interested in the world, yeah. kind of have been to interesting places and, and had windows onto interesting lives. And I, I, you know, I have a few friends who left the industry for a short period of time and mm. gone to try and do other more stable jobs yeah. and work as teachers or, or whatever, which are all, you know, great profession. But I've said, you know, I just didn't find the people oh. anywhere near as interesting as I did documentary people because they're just engaged with the world, you know, every day. Oh, so, um, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I through documentaries, I've got some of my closest friends. When I got married, half the people there were from the documentaries world. Oh, and wow. I, I think if I'd been in another career, I wouldn't have had all, all my workmates at the, at, the, at the wedding. Right, right, right. And, and, and it's funny that you mentioned being away from it. Where we've been in the past year, you know, our work has had us commuting, but but it's just a world of difference, not being around that energy on a daily basis. And uh, in many ways, it's why we're, we're making another move. It just hasn't worked out where we currently are. You know, we were in, in Philadelphia last week attending some conferences, and we also gave some documentary workshops. And it's amazing when you're in a room full of people who documentary is their passion that's what they want to talk about. They want to talk about what it's like living as a doc filmmaker. They want to talk about one another's projects. They're a very supportive community. Yeah, I mean, I really can't say enough about the doc community. Yeah, no, absolutely. I agree. So you mentioned uh, development and, and you were working as a head of development at, at RAW. It's my understanding that you were in development actually on Three Identical Strangers for, was it for four years? Yeah, four years. And look, you know, talking about development more generally i mean yes I, I i would urge anyone who is trying to forge a career in in documentary to consider it as an option because mm. it is one of those bits of the industry that isn't as as kind of sought after um by you know by people looking to forge a career but actually i think it's the perfect place to 
develop your skills. Mm-hmm. I mean, what you do, what, what you do is you, you're exposed to a lot of ideas. You um, are encouraged to be creative, at, even at a very junior level. Uh, it's a relatively stable um, environment like, like you tend to work more like standard work hour kind right. of nine to five nine to six okay. kind of job and it's it's quite well paid in the UK at any rate and, yeah. and what it's enabled me to do is is kind of pick the projects that I want to direct rather than having to oh, wow. become a jobbing director and going from project to project I, I have friends who are really brilliant UK documentaries directors but they quite often have to take projects they just don't care about just to pay the bills. <laughs> yeah. And and, and I, I just couldn't do that. I find the process of making a film so all consuming and, um, you know, it, emotionally draining that I only want to do the projects that I really that care about. Do. That's right. And, and development allows me to sit there and kind of, you know, develop ideas for other people and other projects um, for companies that I work for. And then if the right one comes along, then I can then I'm in prime position you know so i Hmm. I really would encourage people to like consider it as a career because it it really is it really is a career option and it's a really interesting it it, it, i feel it feeds off being a director really well when you're making things you're you're exposed to worlds and people that then give you ideas and and Hmm. then you can go back into the office develop those ideas um have a little breather you know get your get your thoughts back get your life back on track and then go out and make another film when the time is right oh man i i'm glad you stopped me and, and said that uh, because it's it is absolutely worth further exploration i mean i've never you know i've now worked in the industry for i guess 15 years at this point and i've never thought of development outside of 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 this idea of yeah if you want to try to develop a project or in the case of documentary I've only thought of development as this idea of like you need to be developing while you're currently working on other other films, lest you want to have a massive amount of lag time between your films. It's interesting because, I mean, really, aren't you the person that we want to talk to if we feel like we have an idea that is worth further exploration and perhaps aligning ourselves with someone like Raw and saying, hey, I've got a great idea for a doc. Uh, Tim, what do you think about this? Can we develop this? Yeah, no, I mean, you're absolutely right. As someone doing that role, I mean, I'm actually, I've, I've since been promoted more recently to, right. to an executive producer, but, the, but the, right. you know, a head of development in a company is absolutely the person that you should be bringing your ideas to. And, and if they're at all ethical, which most people are, they will com- keep completely separate, you know, your, yeah. your ideas from their own aspirations to, to direct. I mean, I'd say, 98 percent of the ideas that i was i was developing at raw uh, things that i had no aspirations to direct at all but i still in, right. enjoyed the process you know it's it's like being a mini documentary filmmaker all the time you you have an idea you develop it up maybe you cut a little um sizzle reel yes. about two or three minutes and then you pitch it and then the, the you know the one the one tough thing about that job is you have to deal with rejection. I would say the vast majority of your ideas get rejected that's and knocked right. back. But I, but I think that's good. You know, that's good experience, and it, it teaches you not to become obsessed with just one idea. To the, to you know, the, the documentary making is the art of the possible. You know, we, we all have films that we really want to make that are probably never going to see the light of day, and it's about being realistic about that and thinking, well, what are the films? that I can definitely make and that will have an audience and will, you know, I will be able to see this film all the way through. Um, and development has really, has really taught me that. So, um, I think it's a really useful skill to have. Plus, plus it teaches you how to pitch and to write stuff up and to cut sizzles in a way that, you know, I think some filmmakers maybe could do with learning that. Could, could use. Well, and let's further that even even more. Tell me, Tim, what are some of, you know, in your years working in development, what are some of the common mistakes that you would see when, when a filmmaker or a group of filmmakers would come in and present an idea for development to you? What's, what are some common mistakes that you would see? I, if we're talking about commercial films mm. that, that, you know, that, that there are actually kind of sellable and, and can get funding, I think the hardest thing for me is people bringing in um, issue-driven ideas r- without a story. You know, I, right. I, I think that that's such a common thing. I see it at film festivals. I see these films that huge amount of work has gone into that have been made, mm. but they're, and they're a really fascinating issue, but there's just no story. I'm... I'm, I'm I'm watching some people tell me about an issue, you know, and what you need, I believe, and their opinions are divided on this, but what certainly to make a commercial film is some kind of sense of story. Mm. Ideally, you have a combination of story, character and and an issue, a, a deeper, a deeper thematic issue that's going on in the film. Right. You need those three elements. And 
often you don't see the, the narrative, particularly you quite often get issue and character, but nothing else. You can make a film. It just won't be a particularly good one, I think. I think the other thing that I see a lot in development is people pitch what they know. It's like people say you write what you know. So if someone comes right. in and they pitching an idea about alcoholism, for example, chances are nine times out of 10, they will have someone close to them or they will have been an alcoholic themselves. That's right. And when you have to um, talk to them about the merits of their idea, they find it very, very hard to separate um, oh, the idea yeah. from their own life. And, and, and so they feel if you're rejecting it or being critical, they feel that you're, um, you're being critical of, of, of them. And it's not mm. the case at all. And I think learning to separate your ideas and your work from yourself mm. is is tough, but is essential. If you, and, you know, I, I don't consider myself a thick skinned person. I, I, I when people criticize my work, I take it really personally. Yeah, right. But development has enabled me to get to the level where I can I can cope with it, you know, because I'm so used to the kind of rejection from development. <laughs> and I think it's a really um, important, important skill. And and, and I think, you know, if, not, if your idea is rejected, it isn't people aren't rejecting you. They just didn't go for the idea. And maybe in five years time, they will go for the idea. You know, maybe it's time will right, come. Right, but right. you just can't take it personally. And that's that's one of the hardest things, I think, to, to learn in this industry. I wouldn't believe the story if someone else were telling it, but it's true. Every word of it. It started when I went to college. It was the first day of school. All these people are coming up to me saying, Eddie, how are you? Eddie, hi. I'm like, my name's not Eddie. I don't know what you're talking about. As soon as this guy turned around, I knew it was Eddie's double. I said, you're not going to believe this. You have a twin brother. Oh, my God. As I reached out to knock on the door, it opens. And there I am. His eyes are my eyes, and my eyes are his eyes, and it's true. And then the story went from being amazing to incredible. It was an article to Twins Reunited. I think I might be the third. When people ask me what is the most remarkable story you ever encountered, I tell them it's the story of the triplets. You guys have been on the front page of every newspaper in the world. True. true. They were more like clones than they were like brothers. It was a miracle. There was nothing that could keep us apart. That's when things kind of got funky. Tim, lest we run out of time without actually talking about your film, we should probably probably segue to Three Identical Strangers. <laughs> sure. Is- I had an interesting experience recently when 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 Steph and I went and watched Three Identical Strangers. I mentioned that we were in Philly attending some conferences, and that is actually where we went to see it. So we went to a theater in Philadelphia and watched the film. Now, I truly knew very little about this film. Similar to my experience with, uh, you remember, uh, Searching for Sugarman. I literally knew absolutely nothing about this, but I had a few friends that told me, uh, who I respect greatly, you have to go see this film, Chris. And somehow I had I had managed to to avoid hearing um, much about the film at all. And having the experience of watching Searching for Sugarman without knowing what it was about was absolutely beautiful. And it was very similar when I went in to watch Three Identical Strangers. Now, that being said, I would like as much as possible those who don't know much about this film let's try to avoid some spoilers in this conversation if and when we can um as much as we can because i'd love for people to have the experience uh that i did when i went to see it in the theater so that being said tim three identical strangers give us a very brief sort of synopsis of what the film is about and then let's get into how this became became your film so the film tells the story of three identical brothers, triplets, who are separated at birth, raised by different families, uh, completely unaware of each other's existence. They and the families have no idea that that the other brothers exist. Um, They're reunited by complete chance in 1980 New York, become famous. um, And uh, the story kind of picks up there and explores both what happens next to them, but also goes back in time to explore the circumstances surrounding their separation. There's, there's quite a, um, a number of dark twists right. and revelations uh, are around their separation. You're dealing with some, as you said, very dark twists at times. The, one of the first, as a doc filmmaker, first questions I, I had to know was, how on earth did you get the brothers to agree to do the interviews 
and certainly years after after once having been TV celebs themselves and uh, and everything that went attached with being a TV celeb then. How did you get these guys to agree to to come on camera and tell the story again? It wasn't easy. It took a lot of time. They were very wary um, for a variety of reasons. I think firstly because they'd had a really bad experience um, with people in the media before promising them all kinds of things yeah. that had never materialized. And then secondly... I guess when you see the full extent of their life story, you understand why they might find it hard to to trust people. That's right. Um, so it took a lot of time on the ground, myself and the producers of the film, um, going out to spend time with them and their families, and just being really honest about the kind of film we were trying to make, and not um, not uh, sugarcoated or anything. It, tell them we were going to um, be exploring the darker sides of their story as well as the the lighter, and and just being honest about the process really. But it, it took, yeah, it took four years really to earn their trust. And, and, and even making the film, there were occasions where I didn't know if they'd, they'd show up for the interviews. Wow. <laughs> Share a little bit about what your approach was to the actual interview process with the brothers. Um, give us an idea of, you know, if you were having sort of any pre-interview with them or not, or if they were coming in. And because, I mean, there are moments where you're watching it and you see them either come sit down or actually leave the interview. How much strategizing were you and your team doing um, in terms of figuring out what your strategy was for the interview process? And how much did you let on to um, to the brothers and in, in how you were going to approach this? There was a fair amount of strategizing. Uh, what typically I would do, the producer, Becky Reed, um, would speak to them on the phone, do a number of conversations mm. with them, kind of um, amass information. Mm. I wouldn't talk to them at all. So mm. I could go in and ask them the questions again. Ah. But we also, you, we, we knew a bit about them from what had been written. And so I think with those kind of um, documentaries where it's a kind of past tense narrative, or, or, or at least 60%, I'd say, of our film is past tense, you can you can plot out what you the questions you want to ask them and the um and, uh, and where you hope that the story would go. And so prep is really important. But you also have to be open to the story going in un unexpected directions and them saying things <laughs> you'd never heard before. So like, you know, in the interview with Bobby, who's one of the main characters, he started talking about him driving this really old car, this beat up hmm. um, Volvo that we'd never heard about. No one had ever mentioned it to us. He'd never mentioned it to us, but hmm. he just brought that up in the interview. And this that becomes the kind of opening of the film That's and it right. becomes this kind of quite nice signifier of how well the brothers have done what car they're driving yeah, uh, yeah. depending on the different families they've been adopted by so it, it's kind of you, you've got to have a good plan going in and really really know what, what what beats you want to try and hit but you also have to be open to it going in all kinds of directions and not just shut it down and 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 as we talk about the interviews the brothers are one thing and and it is it is it is such a Watching them on screen discuss, you know, what has happened in their lives is absolutely mesmerizing, and they and and these and the key interviews like this are central to to all of our docs. But sometimes it's sort of the ancillary interviews, right, that kind of make a doc go to that next level of complexity. I'm thinking of Aunt Hetty. Chris, I'm so glad you picked up on that because yeah. a lot of people don't, and I think a lot of people obviously focus on the your central contributors or subjects as you call them sure. in the US in in a film. But actually for me the ancillary ones are often, you know, really, really strong and really important. I think of films like Man on Wire, you know, Philip Petit is obviously the main character, but his best friend <laughs> has a moment towards the end of that film where oh, he breaks yeah. down and starts oh, yeah. crying over their breakdown of their relationship. For me, that that those are the moments I, I, I remember. And so Hedy, uh, David's aunt, who's, yeah. who becomes kind of a, a kind of proxy aunt to the, all the triplets when they're reunited. That's right. She's kind of the moral center of the film. She's this, uh, you know, lady uh, in her 80s, a Holocaust survivor. Um, it just incredibly wise. The family refer to her as the Yiddish Yoda. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and, and being in her presence is just, it's like being in the presence of like uh, Mother Teresa or someone like that or the Dalai Lama. Oh, wow. You know, so uh, and she was, without her, the film wouldn't have had the heart that it does. Hmm. So I think when you're making a doc, thinking, uh, obviously thinking about your main subjects, but then thinking about the people around around them who speak to them and speak to the story is, is really important. It is, it is. And talk to us a little bit about, and you know, obviously... You had plenty of conversations, phone conversations or Skype conversations, what have you. There's years of development happening here. But talk to us about what happens as a doc filmmaker. If And let's use this film as an example. You've developed this for four years. You're ready to go produce. 
you get there, you start shooting some of the interviews, and for one reason or another, the interviews fall apart. They don't look good on screen. They don't tell the story well, um, whatever the case is. Are you preparing for that, or how are you best preparing for that? And and it's certainly with this, uh, this is a great example because you know this is going to require quite a bit of travel uh, as well, on top of all the uh, the development that's going into it. So you're a UK based company, you're coming to the US to shoot these interviews. What what if it falls apart? Of course, it doesn't. It does the complete opposite here. But I mean, as a filmmaker, it does happen sometimes. So. What are you doing to vet that process so you can avoid getting into a film and start filming on something that you've spent a massive amount of time already, you know, in pre-production on only to see that, oh, and you know what, this is not going to work. That is a brilliant question, Chris. Uh, I have never been asked that before. I think the truth is <laughs> I try you, <laughs> you, you can't, you have to be prepared to walk away. I know that sounds crazy, right. but like on this film, even when we went out to do the first interviews and I probably shouldn't say this, mm. uh, if in case the funders are listening, but yeah. you know, I, I had concerns that they might not deliver the brothers. They might not turn up. Yeah. You know, literally the night before we were worried that they weren't going to turn up. Um, mm. and, 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 and there's some things that are unsalvageable, you know, if, if they came in <laughs> and they did a really terrible interview or they didn't show up or whatever, you have to be prepared to walk away. Yeah. But having said that, there's a lot you can do to make sure you, it doesn't get to that stage. You can spend a lot of time earning their trust and, and learning about them beforehand. You need to allow enough time so that if they are nervous at the top, um, you know, that they can get more relaxed. Yeah. But I, I'd say this film was unusual for me in that it was the one that I probably was the most worried about the people that I was interviewing yeah. not delivering until I actually did the interview. And actually we filmed – I think we filmed 14 interviews for the film and 13 of them are in it okay wow. and that that ratio i would never normally expect right um, not at all you know uh, on, on my uk docs you know i always you'd have to cut a certain number yeah um but no uh, sometimes things are outside of your control and i i think the other thing as a documentary filmmaker you know you think that you can control if you think you can control everything <laughs> you're just going to drive yourself crazy you that's know, on, right on, and that's why drama is in many ways easier i believe because you know, everyone's paid to be there. Look, it's scripted, you can kind of control yeah. <laughs> things. It's scripted. Everyone knows in advance what's going to happen. Documentaries isn't like that. And I think you have to embrace the kind of unpredictability of it and the kind of chaos side of it. Because if you don't, you'll drive yourself crazy trying to control it all. Tim, tell us about some of the other challenges that were involved in being a UK based company telling a US based story. There were huge challenges. Uh, it's it's a nightmare for me because I'm used to being this kind of verite observational filmmaker who yeah. can just pick up a camera and go and film whenever yeah, I, I down want. Down the street, and, yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> you can't do that with this film. We, we were, we're based in London. Uh, the contributors are stretched from you know New York to Austin to San Diego. Yeah. So we had to be really strategic, and it drove me nuts when we were making it. But actually it was a very good discipline. It, it, it taught me to really focus on what I needed to achieve in the, in the windows when I, when I was able to film. Um, it, it reminded me a bit of the, the filmmaker I mentioned earlier that I started my career with Brian Hill. Mm. He, when I, when I joined him, he used to shoot on super 16 and you can't shoot a ratio of 300 to one on film, you know? And, and I remember going on a shoot with him and we, we had the whole day planned out for a shoot and we got to lunchtime. He's like, I've got it. We're, we're done. Yeah. And you're like, there's a whole crew there that's paid to be there. And I'm thinking, this is insanity. But actually, he, yeah. he just had that discipline. He knew when he got what he needed. Yeah. And, and I think that uh, with digital technology, a lot of us have lost that skill. Mm. And this film, the one great thing about it was that it kind of taught me just to be very, very disciplined about what we needed to get and what did. was feasible in the time frame. Well, it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like the, the the director or the the DP or camera op who also edits. Like they have a keen sense of what tells a story and in particular if you're a shooter as well as an editor, you know what's necessary and you know what's fluff, you know what you don't need so you don't have to keep rolling all the time. And like you said, I think that that is certainly a lost uh, art form um, for a lot of filmmakers today, certainly ones that didn't that maybe aren't editors as well or haven't had the experience of uh uh you know had in, having to actually shoot on film that's that's a that's a good point as we wrap our conversation up here tim i'm wondering through the course of all the 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 the, the press gatherings that you've had all the conversations about three identical strangers what's what is one question that no one has asked you that you wish that they had either about the film or the film process for three identical strangers 
Oh, that's a difficult one. I mean, I like questions about the, and I haven't had many about these, about the the influence of genre filmmaking on on the on the on the film and genre scripted filmmaking. Mm. You know, the the the. the although it's a documentary um it's really very tonally so it starts as kind of like um almost like a body swap kind of comedy um <laughs> you know right. high school movie kind of type thing and we were really influenced by all kinds of kind of cheesy 80s films from things like secrets of my success oh, to ferris bueller so to things like that yeah. but then it kind of then it kind of shifts into yes. into being more of a kind of identity conspiracy thriller and we were literally we were watching movies like um born and things like that oh, for wow. just just a sense of kind of tone and that kind of you know paranoia and conspiracy yeah um so uh, you know i don't tend to get asked about that people always want to talk about it in pure documentary terms yeah. whereas for me all of it is kind of grist for the mill all kinds of um docu uh, filmmaking be it documentary or drama is kind of is kind of relevant and i think it's sometimes good to pull on those different influences brilliant brilliant now having had you know 30 plus minutes of conversation is there anything that comes to mind that you would want doc filmmakers to know that maybe you didn't know say before three identical strangers or before the process of it what's something that you feel like you wish more doc filmmakers had a better understanding of i think that heart is a really um underrated and underthought about element of documentary making it's that kind of emotional truth that you're trying to get to for me to make a film really good you can have narrative fidelity and something can be an accurate retelling particularly when you're doing past events but if it doesn't have heart then it it, it doesn't um it will just feel like a flat retelling mm. and i think working out where that emotional truth is and that emotional connection is is hard sometimes but i think being open to that obviously you've got to think about the wider things narrative and the issues the film's dealing with and that kind of thing but trying to tap into that kind of um human connection with with with, with kind of a, that kind of emotional truth and getting your contributors uh, your, your subjects into a place where they're where they're willing to be emotionally open yeah. and truthful about how they felt about things that for me is where documentary takes off and, and becomes becomes a, it really it really there's a connection with an audience and that's the challenging thing and i wish i'd early in my career hmm. focused more on that rather than i want to tell a story this story in this way stylistically or whatever right, it's right. like actually all the style and all that kind of stuff doesn't actually matter what matters is that human connection we've been speaking with tim wardle the director of three identical strangers Look, Tim, uh, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I truly feel really good about your doc. I, I think it's at least going to be nominated for, an, dare I say, an Academy Award. We'd love to have you on the show again next year when that happens. Well, Chris, it sounds like we're te tempting fate, but I would no, I would love to come back um, yeah. on the show anytime, regardless of what may or may not happen with, uh, <laughs> with award season. But uh, I really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim, and uh, have yourself a great rest of your day. And thanks for being on The Documentary Life. Cheers, Chris. Thanks. Bye. Don't forget, we'd love to have you join us in the Documentary Academy. Come and take a look at how we can help you make your best documentary film at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. That's thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon. Thanks again for listening to the show, and remember to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, remember for any of the URLs that may or may not be outdated, and you want to get the most up-to-date information, perhaps for the documentary filmmaking courses, for the blog, for other episodes, just go ahead and check in the show notes below on this YouTube page, and that'll give you the correct URLs to use. Thanks again. Have a great day.